Hi, welcome everyone. I say I have a episode here, three coaches here, me, Emily, and uh, Professor Bart K. Now we're talking about Bart's journey today, and I'm excited that he came on after the 90-day program and want to discuss a little bit about that. So let's start off with a little bit of an introduction, uh, if we don't mind. Let's go ahead with Emily first, introduce yourself a little bit, and then we'll go to Bart. Absolutely. I'm Emily Harbo. I'm a fasting and carnivore coach, fortunate enough to be in on a period of time when we did kind of a group coaching. We had a bunch of us in there asking, poking at Bart and asking him questions and helping him through the journey. Raymond's training a bunch of coaches right now, and we were able to come in and be a part of the 90 day challenge. So that was a real a pleasure to be there in, on the coaching calls with you guys. Awesome. Bart, for those who don't know, I used to be a professor of health science, and now I'm a YouTube influencer, creator, talking in the carnivore diet space and encouraging people to learn about what is and what is not science and the nonsense that you're being fed really in terms of what they are putting forward as nutrition science. I'm kind of an agitator in the space basically is what I do. Yes. And Bart, you're also a coach, right? So I also do coach people one-on-one -on -one in the background, those that want to consult with and ask me questions about it and make sure that things are on track. We want to talk about uh, the 90 day special. Let's talk a little bit about, we did this similar experiment last year with you, Bart, right? Mm. Yeah. So January of 21 was when we first did it. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Give us kind of like a little summary real quick. Uh, we did a one month challenge. Raymond got a hold of me and said, you know, like, I'd really like to coach you because you know I can see some issues there that, that you're dealing with. My, my main issues were being nearly carnival, but not completely and drinking alcohol. Both of those things were causing quite a bit of problem with my health, really more so than I was probably even admitting to myself. And so I said to Raymond, well, you know, you've, you've bitten off a big chunk there trying to coach me. Good luck, son. Not only will I accept your challenge to coach me for a month, but we're going to do it live on my YouTube channel for everyone to see open hand. And Ray kind of went, oh, uh, all right. Fine. And, he, and he, he, he was brave. He said, yep, we'll do it. And so we did that. Had some really good results over the month. Lost quite a bit of the dad bod flab. I, I almost got a six pack happening in a month. Got control of the alcohol thing a little bit. Uh, and then we finished that month. And then the all the nonsense started about that stage with the with the pandemic and the lockdowns and the don't leave your house and all of that kind of stuff. It was back to drinking uh, cider and eating pizza and corn chips and etc for the next year and so my health was falling to bits again and so Raymond got back with me December last of 21 and said right let's do this again only this time it's three months Charlie Brown and I said okie dokie same deal we'll do it open hand on my channel and he said yep let's do it and the rest is history. Raymond why did you decide to challenge him to 90 days this time instead of 30 days? Well, first of all, on the 30 day one, Bart and I, we were talking with Tom and the crew, the oh, and mosaic mosaic. folks. Yeah. Oh, and then, so I was right. And, uh, and Bart was complaining a little bit at that time. And he was like, you know, saying about how sometimes he'll fall in. And I was like, yeah. you know, that's kind of interesting. I would love to see what would happen because, you know, he teetered like around the 90th percentile, you know, 95% or something like that, a carnivore, but, you know, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to contact him. Let's do a month. And just to see, you know, and I wanted him to feel what it feels like to be a hundred percent, which he did fantastically, actually. And I was actually surprised with the results back then. Now, why I did the 90 days? Of course, I made it a little harder than, than I would normally on any of my clients also. Why I made 90 days after that is because I saw the results and I saw what the capabilities was. And I was like, 30 days was just not enough. That's often what happens in coaching is you do kind of look back and think, man, if I just tweak this one thing. I probably could have gotten it just where a client wanted to be. That's what I was thinking. So Bart, on this one for the three months, what was your takeaway and what was your summary of that? For me, the biggest issue was not the odd packet of corn chips. It wasn't the odd packet of biscuits that I was buying, bringing home, hiding in the office, not telling Pim mm -hmm. that I'd even bought, not sharing with her. You know, those things were problematic, absolutely. And they were having an effect. I'm not saying they weren't, but for me, the huge, huge issue was I was drinking probably 12 units of alcohol twice a week, every week without a little hindrance. Mostly, actually, it was the lockdown thing. It was, it was boredom. It was, you know, mm -hmm. I work from home. I'm, I'm a YouTube creator. I don't have a job to go to. This is my full-time source of income. I've got clients to see online. 
fine. I can do that during the day. When that's said and done for the day, what am I going to do? I haven't had a change of scene. I haven't come home from work. I haven't been out anywhere. I've just been in the house all day, bored. We don't watch television. We don't even have a television in the house. I'm going to sit down and start drinking. And so I was doing that at least twice a week. And so isolation, I'd, I'd, yeah. Yeah, and that too. And I live, I live rurally out the back of nowhere on a, on a farm sort of thing, which is great for most of the time. But when you actually want to interact with people or, you know, I can go and talk to the cow over the fence, maybe that's a good conversation. He's mm-hmm. about my level of intelligence, that bloke, you know, and, and we can sort of moo at each other for a bit, but it's not, <laughs> it's not that stimulating, you know, and he's not interested in cider. So I had to drink it by myself and neither <laughs> him. She's not interested in the alcohol at all doing that. Anyway, and so I ended up with this kind of, I'll send you some pictures, Emily, you can post them up, do whatever you like yeah. with them. Um, most people have probably seen the before and afters on, on the reveal on my channel, but if you haven't seen it, it'll be up here on this one. Emily will splice those in. Dad bod extraordinaire, you know, the and for those that, that are guessing or want to know, I've just turned 50. So I had the whole that thing going on. So for me, the big one was okay, we did a 30-day challenge, as we've been talking about a, a year before. The second it was finished, it was like, right, I've done my 30 days without drinking alcohol. Right, excellent. So I made up for it. <laughs> that, that, that period of abstinence from the alcohol that 30 days was not enough pattern to break that addiction to break that habit more than anything else and as such it was just like oh, hey let's go choice that's a new zealand word it means excellent straight back on the cider again which was all full of sugar and you know just absolute nonsense so i can't believe i used to do that frankly um, do you have a scientific reason that the 90 days or when you just say habit or like the neurologically or uh, gut die off or something like that, that a 90 day would, would be significant? I'm just curious. Um, I, I think in my case, I can only really talk for myself. I think that it was more a habitual thing than anything yeah. else. Sure. Mm-hmm. There was some kind of physiological dependence, maybe. But I doubt that it was an actual addiction or I, was, I certainly wouldn't say I was an alcoholic because I didn't have withdrawals at all over the 90 mm. days. I didn't need it. I didn't crave for it. I was right. doing 90 days without it. That was the decision. There was no two ways about it. At no stage did I feel like going and getting some alcohol seriously at any stage for more than a, a second or more. And no, I'm not doing that. That's not. And yeah. 90 days is just that much longer and the physiological response, the improvements in my body, which were quite phenomenal, quite mm. unbelievable, even to me, <laughs> was something I didn't want to let go of quite so easily the next time around. And it had been just that much longer. And I was like, well, I, didn't, I don't need it. I didn't miss it. Why would I go and put that belly back on, that horrific dad bod situation? I don't need that. You actually look a lot better now than I saw you last time. You've got a nice little tan. You've got the chiseled jaw going on. I mean, this is really nice. So it looks like you're still improving very well. Obviously, Mm. hopefully you didn't go right back to the booze. So apparently you've been keeping pretty good, huh? I I had one splurge on my 50th birthday, which was right right. at the end of the challenge. A a day or so before the 90 days was going to finish. I drank half a bottle of gin and I was so ill. So, so ill. A reminder. <laughs> yeah. Not, not, at, not at the time. It wasn't like I drank myself to the point where I was unwell that night. Right. I right. mean, the next day, I was really unwell. I was like, I clearly had alcohol poisoning, basically. Right. And, you know, couldn't keep water down. Was just weak and shaky. Couldn't drive home. Pim had to do that because we were away, you know, staying with my mother. Do you think that little lesson from drinking that cider after having not had it for such a long time, will that actually affect you on your psychological decision the next time around that you decide to have some? Or do you think that would play an impact at all just because um, you felt so ill? Well, I mean, the, the, the stuff that I had at the end of the challenge year was gin rather than cider. Oh, okay. Because I was going for top shelf, no sugar. Got it. Of course, of course. Oh, yeah. um, and I, you know, as I say, I drank way too much of it and I was very, very ill. The second half of the bottle got consumed over the next week. And as a nightcap, mm-hmm. one small gin and tonic, there was no heavy drinking sessions. Mm-hmm. That was finished within five or six days after that. And I haven't purchased or consumed any alcohol since then at all oh, okay. oh my goodness kind. so it I just agree. came into one purchase your big splurge 
yeah. used it up. We didn't want to waste it, of course. No, and, of course. and now no. and it was a birthday right present from my mum. So you know, <sighs> that's right. That yeah, would right. be rude. It would be rude not to drink it, wouldn't it? Like, disrespectful. You have to exactly. respect your mother. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know what happens when you disrespect your mum? Well, yeah, that's right. That's right. I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when I first saw you on that first month and we saw little ridge marks on your six pack kind of peaking there, that was one of the things I really wanted to see what could been after three months. But really and honestly, you're my age. So I was like wondering, I've only had one other client that was around our age that actually got a six pack out of this. You're mm. the second one. Mm. So this is amazing. It wouldn't be that impressive. It was younger because I've had younger clients. I've gotten there, you know, little that uh, you're the first one that I can say. So really a big deal for me to see. So I really appreciate you uh, attempting to entertain it at least. I hope it wasn't too difficult for you though. That's what I want to ask. Now for mm. the first time around when we did it, I went to go straight to rolling 48s with you. And that was actually pretty difficult. So compare yeah. with the first one to the second one, which one would you say was more difficult, more practical for you? Which one did you enjoy the most? Okay. I would, I would say the way we did it the second time around was easier in some ways and harder other ways. Mm -hmm. going straight to the rolling 48s the first time around when we did the month long challenge this was before you put your program together this was before you devised the priming system that we use in the 90 day program and as such i struggled with the rolling 48s because whenever i'm fasting i always find the hardest day of a fast is the first one yes and so what we were doing is we were continually having that first day every second day so it was always hard with the way we did it the second time around with the priming, obviously the fasting was absolutely dead easy. The fasting was an absolute pleasure every single time we got to fasting because I was so looking forward to fasting because of what priming is. <laughs> and for those that haven't gone through the program or talked to Raymond about this yet, priming basically is eating yourself stupid would be <laughs> one way of putting it. It is just eating so much food that you would Thing. This is nuts. This guy is nuts. What is Raymond asking me to do here? Why is he not saying this? This is crazy. It gets to the point where eating food at all is torturous because you've eaten so much over the first two weeks of the program. When Raymond said, now you can start to reduce your food intake, I was like, yes, please. Absolutely. You bet. <laughs> and then when we finally got to finally start doing some actual fasting, I was like, hallelujah, glory be. Yay, I can stop eating. I never want to eat ever again. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, you know, not so, but at the time, right, that's right. what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, God, if I'd never see another piece, goddamn steak in my life, that'd be great, you know? <laughs> so harder up front. The work was up front this time. It right. was, you know, priming is the work. It's the it tough part. It's, it's it torturous. It's hard. It's not fun. You would think being told, eat as much as you like three times a day and then have snacks on top of that, you'd go, hallelujah, I'm being told right. to eat myself. It's great. It's not. It's horrible. It's not pleasant. It's true. Um, and the, yeah. the couple of days maybe are okay. And, but what we will tell people is if you're still enjoying it, you haven't primed enough. And oh. then we'll also say that unless you hate Raymond, you haven't primed yeah. enough. <laughs> uh, you did it wrong and you never really were a primer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've went through priming. So did you learn a lot about yourself just on the priming phase? I mean, I'm sure this is not something you've ever done in your life, right? Eating that much, or maybe, uh, maybe you have, but I'd like to hear that. No, yeah. no, I've always eaten like a sparrow my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, um, I've always, I've eaten quickly always. Cause I was, I grew up in a household of seven kids. And if you didn't eat quickly, you, you didn't get jack you got nothing <laughs> and it was elbows out and you had to fight for it sometimes sort of thing mm. was like, nom, 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 nom. but i never ate a lot of food and what we did get fed was what most kids were being fed when i was growing up in the 70s and 80s our parents were being told was good for us so it was balanced diet it was fruit and vegetables it was bread and pasta and rice and and we were all avoiding saturated fat because that was going to kill us absolutely of course and it was none of that appealed to me it destroyed my gut function it made me unwell as a kid and so i was just you know i was a small child i you know i not that i'm a huge man now obviously for those that want to know i'm not quite 140 pounds is what i am that's all of it that's all you get five six mm -hmm. Yeah. So not, not a big man at all. And so doing this primary thing, you know, I learned a lot about the limits of my own stomach capacity and how it felt to have it absolutely packed out with food, 
pretty much all day because you know it takes time to process that stuff it sits there it yeah, sits heavy because it's all you know meat and stuff that you're eating as well there's no plant material at all but also it kind of it showed me just what the level of my nutrient deficiency was oh, actually wow. now have you noticed that uh, the times where you could eat carbs that yeah it's very easy to overeat that to the point of bloatedness, but this is very different, right? The yeah. way the satiation comes on is just yeah. very different, right? You bet. Isn't yeah. that interesting? And, yeah. you know, I, I wonder, I have to ask you this because, you know, you're such a science guy, you know, all about this stuff. So yeah. I have to ask you, why has nobody ever really approached it in that format, you know, talked about that kind of stuff or has there been? Well, there are a number of us running around saying, you know, actually, when you when you look at this, meat and fat is the most nutrient dense, most satisfying, satiating, if you like, foods available. This is absolutely our genetic design. All the evidence from anthropology points that way. The only group of people running around claiming to be scientists who actually aren't at all scientists who are saying otherwise are the fraternity that call themselves nutrition scientists. Mm. As I said, they're actually nothing of the sort. They're not scientists at all. They're ideologues. Mm -hmm. They're not doing any experimental work. Mm. Show me a single experimental study with human beings as subjects locked in laboratories for any period of time, let alone multi-decadal studies on which we could make assertions about health effects from dietary intervention of any kind. They simply don't exist. So we're guessing at this with, with a bunch of pseudoscience known as epidemiology, which mm -hmm. is actually poorly disciplined, poorly controlled, in fact, not even controlled at all. It's just nonsense is basically mm -hmm. what it is. Has happened is over the last 80, 100 years, both meat and animal fat have been demonized, mm -hmm. starting with the criminal activities of Ansel Keys right back at the beginning who started this Absolutely. whole thing off. And so the science so-called, the pseudoscience went that way. And so now it's almost just taken as read it's taken as a given that meat will give you cancer and kill you and that fat will give you heart disease and kill you and so we shouldn't be eating animal products so the fact that they give us satiety the most nutrient dense foods on the planet and the fact actually that they are our absolute genetic design and that, that what we've been eating for four and a half million years has been forgotten has been washed away has been whitewashed <laughs> by these basically criminals who are pushing a plant-based agenda on people and saying, you know, no, 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 the, the, the very thing that we've evolved on, the very thing that has been satisfying us and, and providing us with complete nutrition in the most nutrient dense way possible for four and a half million years. No, that's going to kill us now. Eat yeah. the stuff over here that we've invented, these plants that didn't even exist a hundred years ago, eat this stuff instead it just gets forgotten about. And so all the scientists and nutrition science are just going, no, no, we're on, we're in the plant-based wagon. Now we're doing this. And so that's why it doesn't get any attention. That's the question I really had is how hard is it to observe like 10 people, you know, have your control, have your, you know, maybe, uh, maybe 20 people, right. You know, have your yes. control here, for example, vegan side and a carnivore side, and then have one that's sad and just mark, uh, check out their markers for three months, a year, but that's it. It's not even mm. super expensive. Could you not no. do that just to develop a hypothesis? Isn't that how it works though? I thought hypothesis were supposed to be, you know, simple stuff like this, right? Yeah. So, I mean, a hypothesis is just a theory about what you expect you might find. Were you able to do an experiment that can test that hypothesis? The problem in human nutrition studies is you can't test the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. well, because exactly. science is interventional it's disciplined it's controlled it's conducted under lock and key in a laboratory situation under proper observation otherwise confounds degrees of freedom that are not controlled sneak in and undercut a road destroy the validity of your finding and as such you what you're left with basically is anecdote and prospective cohorts which neither of which can inform us in any way shape or form on causality at all. Oh, right, right. So the problem is you cannot lock people in laboratories. The, the thing is, people want to run around and say, this is good for you long term. You must eat your fruits and vegetables because that's how you're going to have the longest, most healthy life. To which I say, fantastic. Show me a multi-decadal controlled experimental study with human beings locked in laboratories under proper observation to make sure they complied. 
that shows that people that ate fruits and vegetables under control lived longer than people that didn't. That study does not exist and it will never exist because you cannot lock people in labs for decades. That's fine, but what I don't understand is all we're looking for is mortality enhancement per mm. se, right? Yep. yep. But is that really saying anything? Because I could live a long life, you know, probably in a cryogenic chamber, mm -hmm. but cool, what kind of life would that be, right? Sure. So what my saying is, is that when we hear these anecdotes, like mm -hmm. me, I'm one of them that healed a lot of things through the carnivore diet. Yeah. shouldn't that automatically state that perhaps just like Dr. Baker always says, perhaps this is the way to longevity is by having less ailments along the mm -hmm. way. And that's why I don't understand why that conclusion cannot be at least hypothesized, you know, enough to say this could be somewhere of a proper human diet. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, not only is the hypothesis valid and reasonable to posit, I have done so on more than one occasion publicly. I have said, not only do I believe that it's a hypothesis that a strictly carnivorous diet is appropriate for human beings in terms of the likely health outcomes of those human beings long-term, that will always remain a hypothesis because we cannot do the experiment under control to establish it. What I would say to people is if you want to look at where the answers that can come from in terms of what has been done scientifically and can be done scientifically under proper observation and control, then we have to step outside of the area of the so-called nutrition science. We have to throw all that stuff to one side, ring fence it and say, that's all ideology. That's all underpinned by money. That's all people that are paid for by the Dietetics Association, big agra, big pharma, all of that, none of that's science. There are areas of science that we can look to. We can look to anthropology. We can go to the anthropologist and say, what have you done that would establish what an appropriate diet for a human being is? And they'll say to you straight away, well, what we've done is we've dug up a bunch of human long bones of all sorts of ages from all around the planet up to and including you know, hundreds of thousands of years old. We've dug collagen, which is a protein, out of those bones, and we've put it in a machine to test the stable isotopes of nitrogen and carbon inside that collagen from those long bones. And that tells us unequivocally slam dunk without any question whatsoever what that human being did eat while that human being was alive in terms of the balance between plant foods and animal foods. The answer is clear from every set of human remains over eight or so thousand years of age from anywhere around the world that those bones have been collected up to and including anything well over 100,000 years. And the answer is human beings ate the meat and fat of large ruminant animals almost exclusively. And there was almost no plant material of any kind in their diet at all. Fact, not even question. That's hard science. The isotopes of nitrogen and carbon. Given that's what human beings definitely did eat, therefore reasonable to go a step further and say, given what we know about evolution, that the genes that would support the eating of meat have been under both positive and negative selection pressures for the same at least several hundred thousand years. I actually think it's more like four and a half million years. Right. We just don't have bones that old. That tells us that human beings have the genes that would support organ systems that would support the eating of meat. So then we go to the comparative anatomists and physiologists and we say, is that what human beings have got? Have they got the kind of organs that would support the eating of meat and not plants? And those comparative anatomists and physiologists will say, you bet, we do have the organs that are designed to eat meat and we don't have the ones that are designed for, for, for plant material. And it all starts to fall into line. And then we go and talk to the people that understand the metabolic pathways, the biochemists. And we say, listen, biochemists, do you agree with the anthropologist? Do you agree with the relative physiology, the physiologists, the comparative anatomists and physiologists? And they say, yes, we do. So the only crowd of people who are claiming to be scientists that don't agree, the ones who actually are the ones not doing any science at all, the nutrition scientists, they're the ones that are outliers. They're the ones that are wrong, that need to get their act together. Yeah. Everybody yeah. else agrees. We are absolutely obligate hypercarnivores, biologically, genetically, organ systems wise, energy systems wise. I've got teeth like this, frugivore teeth. Yes, because we're descended from frugivores about five and a half million years ago. 
and there's no negative selection pressure that required our teeth to change. Not once has a tribe of ancient cave dwelling human beings taken down a woolly mammoth by diving at it headlong with their mouths open. They no use sharp pointy sticks. We're oh. done. We're done here.